Okay, Doug. Well, I think we're going to get started. We've got quite a crowd here today, and uh, welcome everybody to the uh, uh, December board meeting. Uh, we've got some special guests with us today. Um, we've got a group of employees with us today because we're going to be recognizing uh, you folks with the Annual Employee Excellence Awards. Um, we're happy to have you here today, and I'm looking forward especially to making these presentations. Uh, Mr. Coley, if you would note that all the commissioners are here and present. Um, we have circulated our November 15 minutes. Um, do I uh, have any changes or a motion to approve those? So moved. A second? Second. second. All in favor say aye. 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 Uh, today, commissioners, we're taking up resolution 1389, requesting that the city council adopt a resolution setting the electric and gas tax equivalent <coughs> payments for fiscal year 2019 and providing for their allocation to the affected taxing jurisdictions. Uh, Gabe? Yes. Commissioners, as you know, every year we pay uh, the jurisdictions in which we have utilities and facilities to those areas from our utility uh, proceeds. So I'd like to recognize Senior Vice President and CFO Mark Walker to present the payment of the taxes. Uh, Commissioner, as Mr. Bella stated, each year we do make in lieu of tax payments uh, for each of our utility systems to the various taxing jurisdictions in which their systems are located. And today I'm going to talk about pilots for all four systems. Resolution 1389 in of itself, you may have noted, only deals with our electric and gas payments. And that's because there is a provision in state law that um, requires the municipality's governing body or city council to adopt a resolution setting the electric and gas tax equivalents and providing for their distribution. So that's why water and wastewater is not part of that resolution. In total, for FY19, $31.6 million in lieu of tax payments for all four systems combined. Um, I'll point out that it is very close to what we budgeted for the year. It turned out to be like $32,000 more than we budgeted, but that is less than one-tenth of one percent, which is very good budgeting, and I'm pleased with that part of it. Um, but as expected, it is up uh, about uh, $1.6 million, or 5%, over last year's payments. So you may ask, why is it up? Uh, you may recall that there are really two primary or two components to calculating in lieu of tax payments. One is the book value or net plant value of the utility system assets in the respective taxing jurisdictions. And that's calculated in much the same way as your personal property taxes would be calculated. And then for our electric and gas systems, there is another component which is based upon a three-year average of their operating margins multiplied by 4% and then it's allocated among the various taxing jurisdictions. So two components. So why did it go up? $1.6 million. Uh, basically, it is the result of our continued investment in our utility system infrastructure through our Century 2 program, our grid modernization initiative. That is responsible for about $1.2 million of the increase, $400,000 for an increase in higher energy, basically higher energy margins compared to last year. So that's the reason for the $1.6 million increase. Uh, real briefly on the governance, because it is different uh, by systems. For water and wastewater, state law is silent. It doesn't say anything about calculation of pilots for water and wastewater systems. The city charter essentially governs that and sets forth the basis for the calculation of the payments. And so those payments are approved by the board through the, the budget appropriation process each year. And they are based just on the net plant value, the book value of utility system assets, but only within the city limits of Knoxville. In accordance with the charter, we only make water and wastewater payments to the city and not to any Knox County or any other counties on that. And those payments are made the last business day of February. Electric and gas is different. State law says a lot about electric and gas payments. They have their own statutes <coughs> and basically sets forth how they are to be calculated, how they are to be allocated, and distributed among the taxing jurisdictions. And as we talked about, state law requires that the board adopt a resolution, the city council adopt a resolution, and there's both two components for electric and gas. And those payments are made to the various taxing jurisdictions the last business day of June. So what are, breaking them down by system, electric is the largest, um, $16.5 million. 
Those payments go to the city of Knoxville, goes to Knox County, and goes to six other county taxing jurisdictions when a portion, where a portion of our electric system is located. You may recall our electric system serves <coughs> Knox County and a portion of six other counties. Another reason that it's larger than the other systems. For gas, $7.2 million. Those payments will go to the city of Knoxville, Knox County, two other uh, county taxing jurisdictions where we have a very, very small portion of our gas system in Anderson County and also Loudoun County. And then water and wastewater payments combined, that's about $7.9 million. And again, those payments go only to the city of Knoxville. If you look at it by taxing jurisdiction, you can see the lion's share is paid to the city at a little over $20 million for FY19. That represents 64% of the total $31.5 six million dollars and that does represent about 11 percent of the city's budgeted tax related revenue for fy19 so we are a primary source of revenue for the city of knoxville knox county at 10.4 million dollars um, that represents about eight percent of the budgeted revenue for knox county tax related revenue so we're also a primary source of revenue for knox county government as well the remainder of the taxing jurisdictions in total make up around $900,000, and for the most part, that represents assets for the electric system that are located in those counties. If you compare it to how inflation's grown, we went back to 1998 and just looked at how actual in lieu of tax payments have grown for the city, for the county, for all other counties combined over the last 20 years back to 1998 if it had grown at the rate of inflation. And you can see there is uh, a pretty significant gap there. Uh, inflation's grown about 2.2% 2, 2 .2 annually over that period of time, but our pilots have grown about 4.6% over that period of time, which again primarily is a reflection of our investment in our utility system assets. And then commissioners in closing, resolution 1389 uh, does the Board of Opposite is requesting City Council set the electric and gas tax equivalent amounts at those amounts set forth in the resolution that total $23.6 million for both systems combined and does provide for their allocation and distribution to the various taxing jurisdictions. Um, I'll also point out state law does have a requirement that this body, uh, the KUB Board, also consult with city council regarding the setting of the electric and gas payments and there is a provision in this resolution that says the adoption of it and delivery to city council satisfies that consulting uh, requirement and i'll be happy to answer any questions you might have mark i have, I have one question i noticed that sevier county's amount went down the only one that went down is that because the assets are on a depreciated value, or is there no, some other reason? Um, their assets actually grew uh, several, about $15,000, I believe, from year to year. What happened is the equalization rate changed uh, okay. on that, and it actually went down. So essentially, their effective property tax rate lowered, okay. and that's the reason for the decrease. We don't have any further questions, Commissioners. We're going to move on to considering Resolution 1389, requesting City Council adopt a resolution setting the electric and gas tax equivalent payments for fiscal year 2019 and providing for their allocation to the affected taxing jurisdictions. Uh, can I get a motion and a second on Resolution 1389 on its first and final reading? Move for approval. Second. Are there any visitors that want to address um, this resolution? <coughs> if not, Mr. Coley, would you call the roll? Mr. Askew? Aye. Mr. Hamilton? Aye. Mr. Herbert? Aye. Mr. Fennell? Aye. Mr. Simpson Brown? Aye. Mr. Small? Aye. Mr. Worden? Aye. Resolution 1389 is passed. Um, Gabe, the President's report. Thank you, Chair Herbert. Um, Last Saturday, Commissioners, we had an unprecedented extraordinary event occur on the natural gas pipeline that serves this area in Middle Tennessee. 
like to ask Mike Boland, Vice President of Utility Management, to give you an update on that uh, project, uh, event and what we're doing about that. Thank you, Mr. Bolas. Uh, as uh, Mr. Bolas said last Saturday about 2 p.m. Central Time, uh, East Tennessee Natural Gas Pipeline, which is a pipeline that serves us here in Knoxville and most of East Tennessee, <coughs> experienced a pipeline rupture over in uh, west, west from us, still uh, around Carthage, I guess, uh, to put it where it was at, around Carthage, Tennessee, experienced a pipeline rupture on their north line. Uh, it's a 22-inch pipeline. Uh, the rupture occurred in a rural setting. There was no uh, fire. There was no uh, in, anybody hurt. There, were, there was no uh, significant damages at all from the, uh, the incident, uh, but it has caused uh, gas supply issues for us here in Knoxville and others throughout East Tennessee. That's what I'm here to talk about today. As a refresher, and this is it's a pipeline map we've used for years and years and years. Uh, the, the blue line here is the, is the East Tennessee natural gas system that serves us in Knoxville or KUV here with a big star. Over to the, your left, uh, the red line is Tennessee gas pipeline that runs from the Gulf of Mexico up to New York City. Uh, Tennessee gas pipeline uh, for, on this piece of the map here really goes through the state of Tennessee right around Nashville, uh, heading on up to the northeast. And East Tennessee uh, used to be a subsidiary of Tennessee Gas Pipeline. Uh, now it's not, but in, in any event, East Tennessee sources most all of its gas off of Tennessee Gas Pipeline. Um, there are other facilities shown on the map here, most notably the LNG. Uh, you'll notice up around Johnson City on this map, there's a little tank called the LNG tank. That's liquefied natural gas that we have gas in storage there. Um, if you drive up to Johnson City on Interstate 81, right as you get towards the uh, Interstate 26 exit, the big tank sits there on your right, that's that facility. We have a third of the capacity in that, that tank. And then further up, uh, about 20 miles up into Virginia, there's an underground storage field called Saltville uh, that we have access to as well as capacity in there, just to kind of orient you to uh, the system. Now, KUB's assets or KUB's rights on this system are listed on this map. On the north line there, we can take 78,000 uh, decatherms of gas a day. That's the capacity we can pull through there. Um, down on the south, the south line being a much smaller line capacity, we can take 4,400 decatherms there. We've got an interconnect with southern natural gas around Chattanooga, 4,300 decatherms. There's 5,000 decatherms up in uh, some coal seam methane gas up in uh, Virginia, and then another 10,000 uh, decatherms capacity coming out of some, uh, actually it's coming out of West Virginia in, into the pipe up in, uh, up in Virginia. So that in total is kind of our supply assets. So when this pipeline rupture occurred, uh, you'll notice about where the red X is, that's about where Carthage is in the big scheme of things. That's also where our 78,916 worth of capacity comes through on, on, on a peak day to serve our system. Uh, so as you might expect, that has had implications for us and other distributors on East Tennessee. So on a normal day, typical December day, uh, the pie chart to the left shows it's sort of a mix of what our supply might look like. And the bulk of our supply on a typical uh, December day would be coming off a Tennessee gas pipeline. It would be sourced from the Gulf of Mexico mm -hmm. on, on Tennessee gas pipeline. It would be a function of both flowing supplies from people like Conoco, Shell, BP, also storage that's located down in Louisiana that would be pulling up Tennessee Gas Pipeline. We'd be pulling across East Tennessee Gas Pipeline through that damaged section of pipe. That's a typical uh, gas day on East Tennessee. Uh, when the event occurred uh, last Saturday, immediately what we did uh, in, in reaction to that was turn on our asset up in Johnson City, the LNG storage tank, to fill the capacity that had been filled by flowing supplies of Tennessee Gas Pipeline. You'll notice the middle map there, the big section of red, that's the LNG that came on. You'll see a little bit of yellow, that's the saltless storage up in Virginia as well that was turned on. And all the Tennessee Gas Pipeline storage and flowing supplies were cut off, so we were limited to the LNG and then East Tennessee supplies. Uh, since that time, you'll notice on the, on the, by the 19th, 
we've replaced all our supply that had been previously sourced from the Gulf of Mexico. The gas supply is now being sourced on East Tennessee itself, <coughs> either through from Virginia. Uh, actually, it's come from a variety of sources, but let's just say all of them uh, on East Tennessee now instead of anything on Tennessee Gas Pipeline. So every single day has been a new day uh, since, since this event, and I think I think it will continue that way. Every every distributor is looking for supply and changing their plans uh, accordingly. Uh, I, I mentioned when this uh, event first happened, the first thing we did is we relied upon our LNG asset uh, to, to carry us until we made other supply arrangements. Uh, this is a historical use of our LNG tank, and you might notice we don't use it much. Uh, the, the LNG tank uh, is used for cold winter days. That's what it's there for. It's used for cold winter days, emergencies. Uh, it's, it's your your last resort type resource, if you will, uh, is the way we use that facility. And for almost a decade, we didn't hardly use it at all. Um, and we, we pay a lot of money for it, but it's there for a, a situation just like this. You'll notice uh, the physical year 18 last winter, if you recall, if you're in the gas business, you may recall a lot, but uh, last January, it was really cold for about four days, four days in a row there, really, really cold. And so that was the first time we really used much out of the LNG tank at all, was to cover our supplies during those cold days. You can see, since this event, uh, everything we've taken out of, the, out of the LNG tank so far is, is dwarfs everything we've taken for the last decade. So we relied on the asset we've been paying for for all these years to see us through this transition of supply from Tennessee Gas Pipeline to East Tennessee Natural Gas. So it's been a real good investment. Um, so, so far, what have we done in reaction to this? Uh, we are, like I said, we're currently managing our gas supply every single day. Uh, and things are changing every single day. I don't know that we have anything set in place that's not going to change the next day. So there's a lot of activity in the gas supply group right now trying to make sure the, uh, the gas is flowing correctly. Uh, we have curtailed all of our interruptible customers. We have a group of customers, typically our largest gas customers, who pay a little lower rate for the right for us to curtail a gas usage when we need to. Um, these customers typically have a standby fuel, either they'll burn diesel, they'll burn propane, propane air, uh, they'll have some other alternate arrangement uh, to maintain their business even after we curtail them the natural gas. So we have curtailed those customers, which reduces the amount of gas we have to supply, the amount of gas we have to buy, and so they've, they've been doing that. Um, the other thing we've done is we went out to our largest firm customers as well, uh, primarily your larger manufacturer customers, and asked for voluntary reductions in their load. Uh, and, and I've been happy and surprised and, and thankful uh, for the responses we received from all of them in response to the situation. Uh, we've had a lot of different uh, uh, cooperation there. I think it's helped that we've had <laughs> close to Christmas. Everybody was looking to shut down any, anyway. Several of them took the opportunity to maybe shut down a little early. Some people moved supply uh, production to other locations. There's been a lot of different re reactions to our requests. Uh, but between the warmer weather and, and the customers complying, it's worked out really, really well. Uh, there's a lot of talk going on, coordination between us and other distributors and the pipelines and everybody in the gas community, if you will, are coordinating well together uh, to share assets and, and supplies to have everybody get through this while it's getting fixed. And then finally, as a, as a company, we have uh, uh, established an incident command structure. We're looking at the scenario plan. We're, we're thinking about all the things that might happen. We're trying to figure out ahead of time what we would do should it happen. So at this point, the uh, pipeline <coughs> has anticipated the repairs might take between the first to the middle of January. So this is not a situation that's going to go away overnight, uh, but it is one that so far we've been managing through very well. So with that, I'll be happy to answer your questions. Yes, sir. Um, in the where the breach happened, was that gas liquefied? No, so, it was not. Okay, it was, so there's no it went into the atmosphere. Yes, sir. Okay. Very rapid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do they know why ruptured? No, uh, and, and in fact, you know, a big part of what's occurred to date on the repair has been uh, the federal, well, it's 
PHMSA is what it's called. Anyway, there's a federal agency that oversees the interstate pipelines. They've had their experts in there and their consultants and their, their metallurgists and, and all that in, in inspecting and trying to decide what the issue was that caused it. And I haven't heard a cause just yet. So inspector part of it's moved out of the way. Now they're into the remediation and uh, uh, re repair and replacement of the damaged section of the pipe. It's only like 75 foot worth of pipe and it's not it's not, you know, with miles and miles of issues here. So, so our LNG storage tank, yes, um, so we've been using um, that to fill the, the, the need, correct? We, we did initially. Uh, you know, this <coughs> happened on a Saturday. And, you know, most people, and even gas people, they're, they're somewhere else on Sundays and stuff. And so you have the ability to react on, on an automatic sort of basis almost with your LNG tank. Uh, that is a one-shot type of asset. You know, that's really your emergency supply. So we, we use that one while we have to until we found alternate supplies. And right now, we're not currently using it. Uh, we're, we're buying other gas from other sources at this juncture. But it's still there, um, and we're husbanding, if you will, that supply for if there's any other issues that, that may come that we have to address as well. Would there be then a process that we'd have to replace what we've used? Out of the LNG tank? Yeah. Unfortunately, the, the process that liquefies, what they do is they take natural gas, that's a, that's a vapor, mm -hmm. and they compress, 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 compress until it's a liquid. And, and it takes a lot to do that. It takes all summer long. It takes 215 days to get 10 days worth of storage. That, that's how the math works on that. So it is not refillable until next, uh, well, next winter, basically. So uh, it's a one-shot sort of thing. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. And the duration of the fix is less the length and the size of the pipe. It's all the regulatory agencies that have to look at it and assess it and make sure that... From a person that used to be involved in laying pipe, I would agree with you. <laughs> the laying the pipe part is not the hard part. <laughs> That's my view. Uh, so, uh, yes. Uh, one last question for me: Did we did we have to purchase gas at a higher rate? Uh, and and if so, what's the what's the net loss and is it recoverable? Well, we have purchased gas at a little bit of higher rate. You know, our gas is 30 days worth of gas per month, if you will. So far, it's been three or four days. A lot of the gas we pulled out of storage. A lot of gas we already had in contract. Materially, no change. I mean, to our customers and our rates from this. Uh, but that's not to say that everything I bought has is, is not been cheaper than what it was mine. It's been a little bit more expensive. But nobody's taken the usury of us, if you will, uh, haven't taken advantage of us. And, and like I say, I think there really is a cooperative spirit in, in uh, situations like that through those in the industry because we're all going to be here after this is away. So we all want to play fair while, while it's going on. Well, we, we we represent the tax, the ratepayers. So if we, yes. if we lose anything, we got to pass it on to them so yeah. we can get it back yeah. from the people who who, who, uh, who fight for it. Yeah. Mike, do, do we have <clears throat> have we established new supply lines to where if we did run into a significant cold weather snap that residential would not be in, interrupted and commercial would be taken care of or or are we still kind of in a red zone for that? Well, I, well, I'd say we're still planning around all that and thinking about all that. And, and there are a lot of people that are already sort of helping us uh, with our supplies and, and everybody, again, kind of coordinating together. Uh, the very fact that right now we're not having to take anything out of storage, like that you saw on the map there. We're not having to take, that's, I mean, that is a testament to our ability and other people's willingness uh, to help out during the situation. Uh, if you look at the 10-day forecast, we're looking pretty good. Uh, not, not good for gas weather. I mean, if you're wanting to sell a lot of gas, there's not a whole lot of it if you look four to 10 days. But uh, during the time frame in which the pipeline is still working on their pipe, it's nice that we're going to have warmer weather across Christmas. No white Christmas. So. I have one last question. The map that you, the, the first map, yes, a series of maps, is the 22-inch pipe the largest pipe? Yes. Okay, so that that's why we pull the. What are the what's the size of the next? I guess uh, the one that was south. Yeah, yeah. I, honestly, I'm not really sure, but this the the 
the pipe that is uh, broken flowed about 400, what, 400,000 decatherms a day is maximum, and the one on the lower end is like 150,000 a day. So they're, you know, half the size, half the capacity than the other line. Uh, so the, the, the major line is the line that, that had the rupture. So you're below ground or below? Below ground. It was about 10 to 12 foot below ground. Guess stuff won't grow right above that pipe this year. <laughs> Look at the pictures, it's all rock anyway. <laughs> There's no other questions. That's what I have. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners like to recognize Liz Hanna, Manager of Executive Services and Environmental Leadership, <laughs> to give you some good news about some energy efficiency initiatives and cooperation with some other partners in Knoxville. Good afternoon, Commissioners. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm happy to be here this afternoon to share good news about a grant that we've received with our partners. As you know, we've worked closely with our partners over the last several years to secure funding for low-income weatherization assistance programs like Rounded Up and the other programs. We know there are still many customers in need of that type of assistance, so we're continuing to seek additional funding sources to get them the help they need. At the same time, we know the importance of water and energy conservation for our customers, and this new grant from the Southeast Sustainable Communities Fund will provide $300,000 over the next two years, so it's very good news, and I'll provide more detail about that in just a moment. It builds on the momentum of the Smarter Cities Partnership here locally, which, as you may recall, started in 2013 with the City of Knoxville receiving a grant from the IBM Smarter Cities Challenge Program, and they brought together a host of community partners. KUD's been an active partner in that since the beginning. A primary focus of that partnership was to work on improving energy efficiency and develop programs locally with a focus on low-income households. Rounded Up and Keem were outcomes of that work. The other part of that focus was on energy education, and the partners worked together to develop an education program, which is known as Savings in the House. For this grant project, our partners are shown here on the screen, and I'll talk a little bit more about their roles in just a moment. I do want to point out that KUB is not receiving any of the grant funds. They're supporting the roles of our other partners, um, and I'll describe more about those roles in just a minute. Our contributions to the program and the Rounded Up program actually serve as part of the match that helps secure the grant award. We recognize the importance of efficiency information for all of our customers and it's also important to offer along with weatherization assistance. The customers served with weatherization assistance can more fully realize the benefits of a more efficient home if they have knowledge of the energy saving practices and how to properly maintain those improvements that have been made in their home. As you know, a lot of customers are still on the wait list and they often appreciate receiving information about what they might be able to do. And then there are customers that don't qualify for the services and they've been appreciative of receiving information through savings in the house as well. Over the last several years, energy workshops have been offered on a regular basis. There was door-to-door -door outreach that was part of the Keem program and information has been provided to clients at CAC while they're there on site for the services. And you'll re recall, of course, that the partnership efforts related to this work was recognized with the Governor's Environmental Stewardship Award that Chair Herbert received on our behalf and shared with you. That was specifically in the category for outreach and education. The partners have received positive feedback from participants in the education program, and so we've been working closely to find out how we can keep it going and expand upon it. We're very happy to receive this grant to do that. So with this particular project, the education content is being expanded. It will now include water efficiency in addition to energy. It also provides limited funding for CAC to make some water efficiency improvements in the homes that are being weatherized through Rounded Up. So for some of those homes, CAC will be able to implement measures such as fixing leaky faucets or toilets or implementing efficiency devices like faucet aerators or low flow shower heads to help with those homes in addition to the energy services. The content's also being expanded to include healthy homes and UT Extension is helping us with this piece of the program. Like with water, some of the funding can be used by CAC to make some health and safety improvements if certain homes are in need of those measures as well. So that's good news for those homes. One of the reasons we're including healthy homes is the TVA Home Uplift Program that's now underway and you're familiar with. It includes a study to better document the health benefits of weatherization assistance. We know there are health benefits to those households in addition to the energy benefits. 
and that study is being done to better document those so that we can share that information and more actively try to recruit additional partners and hopefully additional funding, for example, from the healthcare industry. And lastly, the content is being expanded to include emergency preparedness information for the participants. The Knoxville, Knox County Emergency Management Agency is helping with this part of the program. KEB's role in this program is to deliver energy and water conservation workshops. We're very fortunate to have support from TVA, as we often do, and some of the resources that they're able to provide through their new home energy workshop program. That includes interactive displays that we can use at workshops. This illustrates two of those, the picture at the top of the screen. There are actually six displays. They're powered with electricity, so we can turn them on during a workshop and demonstrate things like how much conditioned air is lost in a home when a duct system is not properly sealed. So they're very helpful to have those visual and interactive displays as part of the workshop. Participants can also receive take-home kits. The energy savings kit is shown here on the screen, and KEB is also providing water conservation kits for the workshops. And lastly, SEED will be engaging their Green Cap program. That's a career readiness training program for at-risk youth, and they'll be developing and implementing a greenhouse call program where they'll make some home visits to provide educational information and assist homeowners with installation of water and energy saving devices like LED light bulbs and faucet aerators. The grant program complements the outreach work that we already do at KUB to share information with our customers. We try to distribute that in a variety of ways as shown on the screen. The images on the screen are actually samples of some of the social media posts over the last year. Our employees also participate in a variety of outreach events in the community to share information with our customers. Of the 50 events shown here on the screen, the majority of those were actually delivered by KUB's customer counselors who you saw at a board meeting <coughs> earlier this year and they talked to you about how they work on a daily basis to talk to our customers in need and connect them with resources to help them. So being out in the community at these events is just one of the ways that they work with those customers face to face and understand their needs and find out the best way that they can assist them. And lastly, while I'm up here, I just want to mention that our latest environmental stewardship report is available and a copy of it is in your portfolio. With that, I'll take any questions you might have. Thank you, Liz. All right. Thank you. Commissioners, uh, as Chair Herbert mentioned earlier, we have a lot of folks here from KUB we want to recognize, so I want to turn it over to Susan Edwards, uh, Chief Administrative Officer, Senior Vice President, to get kicked off. This is always our favorite meeting of the year because we get to recognize our employees. As you all know, we have a great group of employees here at KUB. They all work very hard on behalf of our customers. Um, so we, we'd like to recognize all of them, but it's especially nice when we can recognize the contributions of those who've really gone above and beyond during the year. Just as a reminder, this program is something that was uh, recommended to us by our former chair, Bruce Anderson, and it's actually the fifth year that we've done it. So we've had the chance to recognize some really great uh, efforts by our employees over that, over that time period. Individual efforts, things they've done on their own, things they've done as teams, innovations on behalf of our customers and things they've done to support the community. We really are, are very happy to be able to take a chance to have you all here with us today and recognize the, the good work that you have done. Uh, to help doing that uh, this year, we also have uh, a list of people over here who are gonna make these presentations and introduce you to the people who are being recognized today. And I'll name them for you so um, we can make this work smoothly. Brooke Sinclair will be our first presenter. She's our manager of System Maintenance, Josh Johnson will give uh, an introduction. He is our plants manager. Darren Rines, who is from our meters group. Uh, Deanna Unger, who is our manager of HR. Um, Steve Profit, who is our new manager of overhead construction. Jamie Davis, who is our director of grid modernization. And Bob Colwood, who is our assistant manager of energy systems engineering. So all of them have a good story to tell for you today. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Brooke. Get us started. from Gas Systems Engineering, or we like to call it GSC, everything has an acronym here, uh, who not only worked on a very challenging and difficult project, but also saved some pretty significant dollars along the way. So let me just uh, orient you a little bit. A couple years ago, we were approached by TDOT for a road widening project where we happen to have a higher pressure natural gas main located along Chapman Highway. 
So um, Ch John Sevier is here. Chapman runs this way down to uh, Seymour, which is in the Simpson Road area, ball fields. And we actually have an older gate station located down here as well. Um, the simple answer would have been to just relocate that pipe out of the drive lane, go back with as is, which can be very costly. Um, it has some other safety factors that are associated with that. So Joey Henry, who was an engineer in gas systems engineering at the time, uh, noted that we could do a couple other things a little differently. We could move that main out of that drive line and also get it out of the construction. Just some inherent risks that are involved with that as well. Decrease the amount of higher pressure within our system and replace that older gate station that eventually is going to have to be replaced anyway. Just this design alone saved us about $2 million from going with that normal project. In addition to that, uh, Joey Henry and Dallas Copeland, who's a project manager in GSE, they took a look at our specifications. We don't do this type of work every day, um, so pouring over those specs, doing additional walkthroughs with contractors, focusing on the pre-bid component to take all the ambiguity out, um, saved us some additional dollars as, a, as compared to our estimated cost, because ambiguity in the bid world can equal additional cost there. So. Um, that was a big component. In addition to that, Dallas essentially has lived on site over the last year. Um, from a gas perspective, documentation is huge. But our goal here is always contractor adhering to those specifications strictly because we have main contractor subs, so on and so forth, collecting that data, and then um, more importantly, making sure that that pipeline is going to be that pipe's going to be installed safely the first time and there for 100 years to go. So this work resulted in some additional savings to KV as we continued on that process. And the bottom line is we were completed ahead of schedule with the main portion which was completed in August and we went from a very difficult terrain, lots of trees, to, to basically a fairway. Um, looks really nice there. Uh, the, the gate station itself is in its final days of commission that we're working with the transmission company on to finish that up and should be in place over the next couple of days. So with that, I would like to recognize Dallas Copeland and Joey Henry. Wastewater operator begins work at KUV, we provide them on the job training to prepare them for certification tests so they can be licensed in the state. Um, part of that certification test is laboratory analysis. And while the KUV Water Quality Lab completes all our compliance uh, analysis, we needed to provide some hands on experience for the operators so they can learn more about the analysis and be prepared for those certification tests. Tom Pucci saw this as an opportunity and he recognized that we could provide that for the employees. He developed the layout for the lab. He helped procure the correct equipment. He used some equipment that we weren't using, uh, developed standard operating procedures, and trained those operators. So today we are using this solids laboratory. We had five employees take certification tests recently. All five passed with um, them coming back and telling us that these, this, this solids laboratory made a difference. Those te the test questions were on there. So, uh, Tom Pucci, thank you for your help. It's my pleasure to tell you about one of our employees by the name of Adam Owen. Uh, this goes back to September 18th of this year. 
Adam was on his way to visit a customer in Powell. On the way, he noticed a mail truck on the side and smoke coming out from under the hood. He also noticed that the mail carrier was in the rear of the vehicle frantically pulling the mail out. He began to turn it even as a bystander flagged him down. Um, he assessed the situation quickly, grabbed his extinguisher and went to the vehicle. He found the people trying to help having trouble opening the hood latch and he quickly opened it. A fire had begun to develop. He extinguished the fire and as is his typical nature, once he made sure the scene was safe, he just went back to his vehicle and went on to his next job. <laughs> I think in that moment, he clearly demonstrates what many of us believe here, and that is that we value the safety and the well-being not only of our employees, but also our customers. So with that, I'd like to uh, ask Adam to come up here and receive this award. today about our ergonomic program here at KUB, which we've titled the Work Healthy Program. This is a new initiative for us. Back in December of 2016, we realized we could do more to invest in our employees' well-being. We had had some recent strains and sprains, specifically in overhead construction, that gave us concern, and we felt there was more we could do to prevent those strains and sprains, and especially surgeries that had come out of those strains and sprains. Uh, so at that time, we partnered with Grant Davis. He's an industrial athletic trainer with Blunt Memorial, and he helped us design a program where we could incorporate ergonomics into every day for our employees as they have very physically demanding jobs. So we had a team of safety, HR, and overhead construction where we piloted the program to help us design and implement this program. Uh, we did see in FY18 that there are over, in, 120 hours of education and training about ergonomics. So Grant Davis was critical, the industrial athletic trainer, but also Emily Smith from HR, and Jeff Hall, Kevin Reed from safety, as well as Mike Smith from overhead construction, helped design this and make it a part of every day in their workforce. Uh, whether it was education by doing a presentation, as you see Grant Davis here in the picture, he is teaching underground construction on some stretches that they could do out in the field. Um, or we had opportunities where Grant would go out in the field and observe the work and do multiple crew visits. We saw several hours uh, that they put in the time to be able to really make an impact into the culture of our employees every day. So in, in that essence of creating a good culture where this is front of mind for our employees, we started to see employees take their own creativity and come up with innovative ways to do the job better and more ergonomically appropriate. So you'll see here in the before picture, this is in grid modernization. They had a process where they would lift a 75 pound meter lid out of a bin. So as you can imagine, the lower back strain, the shoulder strain that is caused by the former way of doing this process. Um, the supervisor, Carol Ferguson, contacted Grant Davis and said there's gotta be a better way to do this. And as you can see in the after picture, they now are not bending over to lift those lids and they're able to pull it out more in that waist height area. The outcomes we have also seen in our metrics and, and we're happy to say that we were able to see a reduction in the numbers of our strains and sprains. So we did have an FY17-19 across the organization that dropped to 11 and in overhead construction specifically where we've uh, spent the most time and piloted the program, we saw a decrease from nine strains and sprains to three. And uh, we realize we won't see these numbers every year, but that culture that we're creating, the innovation, our employees feeling empowered to find new ergonomic ways uh, to do their tasks every day, we're excited about how that looks in the future. And you'll hear about one great example in just a moment from Steve Profit. So at this time, I'd like to recognize the Work Healthy Program team, Emily Smith, Jeff Hall, Kevin Green, who's not here, but we have Mike Smith from OHC representing the team. Congratulations. Thank you. We have an Donald Strong. We'll let the middle name have the 
side those are 69 kV breakers those are located in every substation that we have on the system coming off the high side of that breaker they're noted by the, uh, the arrows in red before this breaker can be worked on by the crews and do that safely this breaker must be de-energized tested for the absence of voltage and then grounds need to be applied right there on those those jumpers where the red arrows are this creates some challenge uh, we're, we're fighting the weight of a an eight-foot stick, which Tony will step up here in just a second and demonstrate. Uh, we're, we're fighting the weight of the ground as well as gravity on that vertical surface there. Uh, in, in recent months gone by, we've had a couple of significant injuries uh, to the shoulder. So a team was formed looking for mitigation opportunities. As we talk about the force that's needed to apply on that vertical jumper, you can see the lineman's position. And Tony step up and he can. He can kind of show you how that works. It, it looks like a two-handed operation at this point in time, but really because of the vertical jumper, the operator of that stick is forced to use one arm totally <laughs> to, to bring pressure against that clamp, hold it tight on the jumper while he's twisting with the right hand to tighten that clamp. Based on what Tony was able to come up with uh, and create from in-stock material, he came up with this horizontal clamp. Uh, the clamp is made out of all stock material that we have available. Uh, he, he put this together, engineering signed off on it that it would take care of the ampacity needed for the grounding. And you'll notice the close-up of this clamp, they're actually designed to be put on a horizontal surface. So this worked out great for us. The result of that, the left side of the slide, you can see that the, the amount of force needed to apply that ground uh, was, was drastically reduced. And those, that creation uh, that Tony come up with, that's being installed now on every 69 kV breaker as we pull maintenance on that. So moving forward, we're going to look to reduce those injuries significantly. But with that, I would like to, uh, I would like to acknowledge Tony for his creativity and ingenuity uh, in creating that horizontal grounding post. Commissioners, uh, one of the ordinary things that occurs at KUB every day, unfortunately, is that somebody's going to dig in on our utilities. And we don't like that. And even though that's an ordinary case of business sometimes, there are certain situations that occur that really do give our folks an opportunity to shine as they respond to that. And this indeed out in the Hardin Valley area this past August was one of those. There were two or three things that really made this a little bit of a different dig in. One of which was a third party contractor working for one of our uh, fellow utilities uh, out that region uh, found our eight inch line. And that was one of the first things is, is an eight inch line is a pretty big line in our natural gas system and doesn't necessarily get dug in that often. Uh, the second thing is, is, and you can kind of see in this picture a little bit the nature of the impact, and this was actually after a little bit of work had been done to it, a lot of times when folks dig into our, into our utilities, those teeth on the back hole will find it and poke a hole in it. In this case, it was like taking a knife down a piece of wax and kind of curling it up. When we repair that, we need a nice smooth surface to put a clamp on to temporarily fix that. Well, that didn't present that, self, uh, that situation as well for us either. The last is, is they, they, they picked a lucky spot in our system. We don't have many dead-end legs in our system, but they found one. And because of the nature of this repair, had we had to cut the gas off, we would have lost approximately 300 homes or 300 customers on the end of that line. And that means a multi-day response in the gas world. Think about a storm that comes through on the electric side. That's what it would have been like to work through the relighting process with our customers. And that's not only resources inside of KEB, but that's also a headache for our customers that they really don't want or expect as they, as they receive our KEB service. So needless to say, 
uh, setting the stage a little bit too about that eight inch line is, is that gas is escaping that line, uh, it's kind of like sounds like a freight train. You know, it's enough force to really kind of wave the trees that are around you in that proximity. And as you can imagine, that smell of natural gas that's in the air already, the situation, as always, really did require quick thinking and expertise. So our underground construction group was dispatched to respond to that. First, our first responders to kind of get boots on the ground, see what was going on, to give time for our lead crews to get there. Uh, their quick thinking and ingenuity, once they kind of assessed those situations that I just talked to you about, uh, those folks came up with an idea that were able to throttle down the supply, make the repair safely, and still keep those customers on. And so during this, they not only exhibited over uh, you know, in many cases on the crews, a century worth of experience, but the crew leaders are even here today, decades of experience in the natural gas industry, uh, not only provided for a quick and timely and safe repair, uh, but also demonstrated great customer service, not impacting our customers as well, and might I dare say even just a little bit of bravery in dealing with this. Uh, so at this point in time, I'd like to recognize the three crew leaders. This was the, the team that responded. <laughs> Uh, but three crew leaders here today, Robert Dockery, Jason Heller, and Brian Sharp are here today to, rec to re uh, represent the team. Commissioners, I'm pleased to come before today to tell you about a great opportunity that KB had to help Park West Hospital this past summer and turn a potential bad situation to a great opportunity to shine. KUB spends its time improving, maintaining, and generally solidifying its reliability. Hospitals, including Park West, are no different. Reliability is a big concern for them, especially electrical liability. For KUB to help Park West this past summer, a maintenance team was on site to inspect their electric facility shown in the red circle below. It included two transformers and a switch gear. Visual inspection showed a few things that caused them some concern, so they brought in a few other folks to get some more in-depth information. Shown here is the picture of the conductors as well as what we call infrared thermography picture on the right. In essence, infrared thermography pictures show how much heat an object has. For electrical equipment, the more heat an object has, the greater chance it has to fail, which in turn could cause some unplanned outages. And for a hospital with patients and sensitive procedures, it's a pretty big deal. When the team saw this infrared thermography picture, they gave them more information, and immediately they assembled an ad hoc team from five different departments within KUB to quickly, safely, and efficiently address the problem. The five different departments within KUB were Station Management Services, Electric Systems Engineering, Key Accounts, Overhead Construction, and System Operations. The team came together not only to come up with a solution to the outage, but several interesting factors such as the transformer that you'll see in a minute serving the hospital is unusually large. It's not a typical size that we find on our system. Finding a time to change out the electric system for a time that worked well for the hospital, including their patients and their doctors, and then having the crews rearrange their schedules so that they would be able to properly address the problem. On top of that, the hospital told us that oh, we really need to get the, the work done between six to eight hours. I am pleased to say the team got the work done in less than four. So as we mentioned before, there's the size of the transformer that they had to replace. With the crew in attention there, this is the before shot we saw earlier and the after shot we saw. The absence of heat is a great indicator that everything was done very well. Not only did KB step in to help Park West Hospital, the team was able to help KB develop a large maintenance or a large transformer maintenance program to see additional transformers around our system and head off more problems before they became problems. Additionally, key accounts use this as a springboard 
to improve their already great relationship with the hospital, find out what their needs were and how to better serve them. As we mentioned before, this is not a one-person effort. This is a large team of folks that came together from the five different departments. Individually, each team member did a great job. Together, the results were absolutely terrific. Shown here, on, on the names here are all the people that are on the back row of the picture. And shown here are the names of the people that are there on the front row. So at this time, I would like to call up some representatives of the team. Candace Scruggs, Matthew Stinnett, Tim Ramsey, and Dwayne Rankin. And these folks are getting the board chair award today. Um, I think that you all could see what a great organization KUB is. And it's always hard to choose from all of the wonderful uh, work that uh, KUB does uh, for our customers. Um, but in my mind, uh, this one uh, was something that if it had not been uh, found, could have had some really serious repercussions uh, for a number of people in the community. Um, so I want to thank these folks for uh, quick thinking and for collaborating. And I think that um, today especially uh, demonstrates for me um, how proud I am to be the chair of this board. So thank you for your work. extraordinary events that we went above and beyond the call of duty to, to provide safely, work with our, co our community, with our co-workers. I can't say enough about how much that represents a lot of what KB does uh, every day with our, with our community. So thank you all, congratulations on the award, and I appreciate all you do for us. You know, when you come to the end of a year, you know, you sort of think back on accomplishments and uh, seeing all of you and hearing about these uh, accomplishments is a is a great way to to end the year and sort of realize that this is an organization that does great things and is going to continue to do great things but the reason that we can do that is because of the employees that we have so we are especially thankful for all of you um, we have now uh, uh, the nominating committee uh, report uh, Commissioner Pinnell uh, commissioners, in January, the board elects officers as required by the charter. The nominating committee met earlier today and voted to nominate the following slate of officers for 2019. Chair, Kathy Hamilton. Vice Chair, Tybee Small. Secretary, Mark Walker. The election will be conducted in January 2019 as required by the charter. Maybe February. <laughs> Are there any... Um, uh, is, is there anything else that we need to hear from you on that, Sarah? Okay. Uh, there is one member of the public that has signed up to address us today. Um, if there are others that have come in, let us know. Uh, we were thinking that we were being very progressive in getting this new fancy light uh, that would time things. And um, uh, after one meeting, <laughs> it has decided to go on strike. <laughs> so my iPhone will be the trusty uh, timer. Uh, maybe maybe y'all can innovate something. that thing work on time? But uh, Mr. Kent Minault, uh, you've got uh, five minutes to address us today. 
And if you would, tell us um, uh, your address when you come up to talk with yeah, us. Yeah. Yes, uh, well, I don't think the light will be necessary. I, I think I can respect the commission's time on my own. Uh, yeah, I'm Kent Minow. I, I live at 311 West Glenwood Avenue. Uh, thanks for this opportunity to uh, address this commission. I, uh, I'm a new arrival in Knoxville. I, I come to you from uh, Los Angeles, California, so I've been here since the 1st of November. But um, I, I own a property in Knoxville for several years because uh, my, my daughter and her husband and family live here, so I visited. And, and um, I enjoy, uh, in fact, I want to thank this board for the uh, energy efficiency rebate that you gave me on my property because uh, in Fountain City I owned a house and my, uh, because of this energy efficiency upgrade that I got, which was very well done by a company called Rocky Top Air, I think, and uh, they, um, uh, they uh, got my tenants a 30% reduction in their energy usage. And uh, I uh, didn't see fit to raise their rent for that. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to thank you for it because that also that uh, upgrade helped, uh, helped me sell the property quickly uh, earlier last year. And the new owners were very uh, happy to hear about that. Now, I've got a concern here because, um, and by the way, I, I appreciated Ms. Hannah's presentation about the energy efficiency work that you all are doing. I'm certainly quite a bit smarter than uh, when I came in the room. But I understand that the energy efficiency rebates are going to be discontinued at the end of this month. If I'm wrong about that, please correct me. But um, I would like to encourage this group to bring those back and, in fact, make them more generous. Because energy efficiency upgrades and energy efficiency rebates are not just a kindness or a social service to less rate payers. They're also smart business for the utility. Because the cost of electricity and gas that you don't need to provide is often less than the cost of new power plants and new supplies. Um, and by the way, I come from Los Angeles where there's an excellent energy efficiency program at LADWP that I studied carefully and the, the guy in charge of that is named David Jacot. And I urge you to consult with him because he's just terrific in the area of efficiency. And LADWP provides energy efficiency upgrades to low-income customers for nothing. And uh, they consider it good business as well. And one thing they do is uh, they compensate for the loss of income by getting a new income stream by energetically advocating electric driving. And electric driving provides an energy, of, a, a, an income stream for energy that's generally provided when it's cheapest for the utility to provide it, namely late at night when most cars are charged. So I encourage this board to think about programs that would incorporate that kind of innovative logic. I know that in the past this group's been famous for its innovation. So uh, I encourage you to think about those things and thanks for your attention to this. And hey, no like necessary. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you for those suggestions. Uh, we appreciate those. Uh, is there anybody else that wants to address us today? Following the adjournment of this meeting, the board will have a lunch session across the hall that's open to the public. And if we have no further business, this meeting is adjourned. Thanks for being with us today.